The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Straight Talk with Sandra Reich. Are you trying to master the game of life without success? There are secrets and strategies to living your best life. We'll share some of them with you on today's show. Take advantage of this series to become an expert at relationships. All relationships. It's time to live the life that you deserve to live. Now, here's your host, Sandra Reich. Welcome to Straight Talk with Sandra Reich. I am beside myself today. Um, I have a very, very special guest and very personal for me. I don't even know if she realizes how personal it is for me. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Dr. Sue Johnson is an author, a clinical psychologist, a researcher, a professor, a uh, very popular presenter and a great presenter. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and a leading innovator in couple therapy. So you can see how she's affected me. She is the primary developer of something called emotional Focus Couples Therapy, which has demonstrated its effectiveness in over 25 years of peer-reviewed clinical research. Um, she is... I've, I've actually done two trainings with Dr. Johnson, which have profoundly affected my career and my work with couples. Dr. Johnson, it is a particular honor to have you on the show. Um, <laughs> I, it's your That's work... That's quite for- an introduction. Well, it, you know, I'm here at my office and I see couples all day long and um, there's no joke here. Emotional focus therapy and your work has changed thousands and thousands of couples' lives. So welcome. It's yeah, real long. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm curious right off the bat, because some of these are going to be a little bit of curiosity questions. I've just finished re- reading your new book, which is absolutely brilliant. It's called Love Sense, The Revolutionary New Science of Romantic Relationships. Um, I couldn't put it down. It's it's like cutting edge, new stuff. I, used, I had a few sessions today. I've already used a lot of it. I want to go through um, a lot of key points for my listeners uh, in terms of your research. I'm curious how you got started in your research. How did this all start for you? Um, I think it started when um, I started working with couples and became completely fascinated and then realized that there were no maps out there. There was, there was really, as a student learning, um, I couldn't go anywhere to get any kind of real guidance. And so I just started taping my couples and watching them and learning from them and sort of stumbling my way into um, realizing that when you change the way people deal with their emotions, you change the music of the dance in a couple and starting to realize that the way I was learning to do it was somehow having this huge impact on the couples I was working with. And at the time, you know, emotion was kind of considered dangerous stuff, especially with couples. Nobody was really doing very much couple research. And I sort of had been kind of given another thesis, which didn't um, to do for my doctorate, which didn't really interest me very much. Um, And I just kept getting, going back to these tapes and writing down my interventions and suddenly it just hit me this is crazy i if i'm going to do um a thesis i've got to i've got to show that this stuff works i've got to find out if it really does work i've got to do mm. a study which when i look back on it was insane I mean, it, was, <laughs> it was it was an insane project for a, a student it was it, if one of my students told me they were going to do something like this, I'd tell them they were completely crazy. But we did it. And once, once I got hooked on um, looking at all these couples and looking at the tapes and finding results and learning from, every, from that study, 
I, I was just hooked. Uh, research became um, just the obvious thing that went along with my clinical work. You know, I, I learned and I got enthralled with what I was learning, and then I, I wanted to show, I wanted to find out the real effects it was having on couples. And then each time we, we did research, we learned more clinically. So it just became this, had this kind of momentum to it. Yeah, it, it's, it, it led to you uh, developing emotional focus therapy, which is really the treatment of choice these days for couples. And you wrote a book called Hold Me Tight, Seven Conversations for a Lifetime of Love, which is like the book uh, us therapists and couple therapists go to, to help people understand, that, as you call the, the music of love. And uh, it's so, and the dance of love and attachment. I want to try very hard to cover these issues today. They're so fascinating. Um, this book that you've just come out with, Love Sense. I'm wondering, you know, what made you call the book Love Sense? Uh, Hello? Well, I was oh, trying sorry. to basically say that we've made, se- that now um, in the last 15 to 20 years, um, and I'm very proud to be part of this, that um, psychologists have finally got to the place where we can make sense of love. Where yeah, it's we amazing. We understand that it's a whole lot more than um, a very big friendship or a whole bunch of sexual desire that we understand that it's an, a wired-in survival code designed to keep uh, someone you could depend on close to you and available to you, and that this is something totally basic to our species. Um, it's, it's not something that's dispensable or that we grow out of. And we've really started to crack the code of love. And what I was trying to say in that title is that we can make sense of love we can understand it, and what you understand, you can shape. Yeah, that's such great news for couples listening that are struggling um, because a lot of them don't have the code and they don't have the maps. And once they learn the maps, I know you've seen you know thousands of couples. And once you talk about it in the book, once they come in and learn how to you know respond and understand and talk from a vulnerable spot, it's they can turn their couples completely around. It's it's really quite magical. Yes. I still find it magical after all these years. I still see couples and, um, you know, I still find it magical and I still find it exhilarating. Yes, me too. I agree with you. So in the book, another thing that stood out for me in Love Sense is that you talked about that all the research shows, because I want to go back to the beginning for people listening, that uh, having a stable, loving relationship is the absolute cornerstone of human happiness and general well-being. Being. And you say it's better health insurance than a careful diet or and better anti-aging than taking vitamins. Talk to me. This is good. <laughs> Well, I, need, you know, I want really to know. Really, there's really some fascinating research. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, something that wouldn't have happened even 10 years ago. The um, Heart Institute in my city, here in the capital of Canada, um, came to me and said, um, would you please take your book, Hold Me Tight, and um, we know you've got an educational program based on Hold Me Tight this book, would you please adapt it for cardiac patients, cardiac couples, because we've read the research um, that talks about the fact that the very best predictor of whether you have another heart attack uh, or how long you live after your first heart attack isn't the severity of the attack, it's the quality of your most intimate relationship. And, you know, therefore we want you to come and help these couples so the fact that, you know, there's a, a renowned medical facility that comes to me who's a, um, a psychologist working with relationships and says, would you please help these couples with these relationships because we've looked at all this research that says that, you know, whether you can turn to somebody at, for support, whether you can rely on them, whether you feel that someone has your back affects everything from your immune system functioning to your blood pressure to how you deal with stress to how you cope with new stresses and problems like changing your diet, um, you know, which um, heart, uh, cardiac couples have to do. I mean, the research is pretty overwhelming that we are social bonding animals 
And um, emotional isolation or conflict is amazingly stressful for us, amazingly yeah. stressful. And we need this safe haven that a loving relationship can provide, and we need it from the cradle to the grave. Yeah, and creating that safe haven is, you know, such a challenge for a lot of couples. And you talk about, and I think we need to demystify this for people listening who don't know the jargon of this, is, you know, it has a lot to do with the way um, you respond to each other and also your attachment style. Now, your attachment style starts in childhood uh, in your love relationship and plays out in your love relationship. Um, can you talk a little bit about this and maybe the strange situation experiment, how we found out about this so that people know what we're talking about? Yeah. Um, all this um, understanding of attachment and bonding started with a man called John Bowlby, who way back in the, oh, really, in the 1950s, 1960s, um, started talking to um, orphans and widows, people who had lost the people Hello. they loved, and um, started really seeing patterns. And then he got together with another psychologist, Mary Ainsworth, and they decided to sort of look at the drama of bonding by um, taking children and their mothers, very young kids, and having the mother leave the room for three minutes and then walk back in. And they decided to see if there were things that all children experienced and behaviors that all people, all children showed, and whether there were differences, different types of kids, different types of responses. And what they found was that, you know, every child was upset by the mother leaving, um, every child expressed pain, and we know now that the pain of being deserted or rejected in human beings is processed in the same part of the brain and in exactly the same way as physical pain. So um, That's losing big. the people you love is, is a danger cue for your brain. So these kids would go crazy when the mother left, and when the mother came back in, they would have, they would, you know, most of them would run and, and get comfort from the mother and then they'd calm down and go back into equilibrium. And Bowlby just looked at this drama again and again and sort of drew conclusions from these patterns. And he found that kids all showed this emotional response. Um, and we know that strong emotions are a real key part of love. But there are also sort of three basic different patterns that emerged. Yes. The kids that really sort of um, seemed to expect that their, their parent would um, be there for them and would be responsive to them and would predictably comfort them, they were not so distressed when the parent left. And when the parent came back, they ran to the parent um, asked the parent, like said something like, pick me up, pick me up. And as soon as the parents started to comfort them, they calmed right down. And then they went back to playing. They went back to exploring the world, which is what you do. When you know somebody has your back, you feel stronger and safer. And so paradoxically, when you know you can depend on somebody, you're able to be more separate and autonomous and independent, so you go out and explore the world. And he called these kids secures. Okay. And they, when they were starting to be able to talk, they could express that they saw the world as basically a safe place where other people would help them and respond to them, and they could go out and explore the world. And then he saw that there were two other kinds of kids. One he called anxious, preoccupied and usually these kids had a history where sometimes the mother and the father would be there for them and sometimes they wouldn't be. So the kids were obsessed with predicting what the parent was going to do. The kids would get very upset when the parent left. When the parent came back, the kids would be just flooded with anxiety or with anger. And so they'd send very strange messages. They'd asked to be picked up in an angry voice. They'd get angry. They'd cling to the parent, and they were constantly focused on where the parent was, and they wouldn't calm down, and they wouldn't let go of the parent and go and explore. They'd just hold on all the time, 
And we call this anxious attachment. And you see it in adults, for example, where you can get people who um, are obsessed with uh, making love and say to their partner, you have to make love to me every day. If you don't make love to me every day, it means you don't love me. They're, They're jealous. They're always wondering where their partner is. So these kinds of patterns seem to go through into adulthood. And the third one was what Bowlby called avoidant, where um, sometimes the mother would leave the room and the kid would look like they didn't care. And the mother would come back in and the kid would ignore the mother. And um, the mother would pick the kid up and the kid would just sort of respond on a minimal level and then go back to playing. The kid looked like they weren't bonded and they didn't care. But if you wire that kid up um, to see what's happening inside their body, the kid was through the roof. They were very upset and aroused, and what they were doing was struggling to shut it down. And it was these kids had often been abused, or they'd had um, very neglectful parenting, and it was almost like they decided that other people weren't safe and they weren't going to depend on them. And this goes through into adulthood, too. Um, You see people, for example, men and women, who um, the minute they or a partner becomes vulnerable, they basically move away. They change the subject. They leave the room. They get angry at the person. Um, They're very obsessed with being independent. They don't want to share. Um, These folks are much more likely to have one-night stands, for example, they focus more on performance and uh, in sex than other folks do. They're not comfortable with being close. So, so what this... Bowlby did was he found these patterns and he said, this is the human being, a bonding animal, and these are this, this is this dance um, that we create. We are vulnerable for longer, for longer than any other species in the world. We know when our brain is being formed that if we call and no one comes, we die. And this is how we deal with our need for other people in these patterns through our life. Now, you can change the patterns, right? But okay, so Dr. Johnson, said, I, I, I'm sorry, so sorry to interrupt you just when we're going into how it's going to affect the couple. So let's just take a short break and we're going to come right back and bring these attachment styles into what happens into romantic relationships. This okay. is Sandra Reese with Straight Talk with Sandra Reese. Join the therapist who is affectionately known as the couple whisperer, Sandra Reich, on her famous couple retreats and change your life forever. Sandra offers couple retreats in beautiful locations several times a year that can radically change your love life. Couples describe her retreats as life-changing. Regain that loving feeling. Bring your intimacy to a new level and rediscover excitement and joy. Find out more at helpforanxietydepression.com or call 514-796-4357. We all want love and safety. Now you can have it. Call 514-796-4357 or helpforanxietydepression.com. Spa Munari is a full-service wellness day spa located at the heart of West Island, Quebec. Submerge yourself in beauty with one of our many treatments, specially catered to your needs. We offer facials, manicures, pedicures, hair removal, massages, body treatments, and so much more. Enjoy our ultimate relaxation experience with our spa packages. We offer a men's menu as well. Call us today to book your next appointment at 514-695-5040 or visit us on the web at spamunari.com. That's 514-695-5040 or spamunari.com. Change your life forever with the latest cutting-edge products for home study treatment for anxiety featuring the clinical director of the Montreal Center for Anxiety and Depression and host of Straight Talk, Sandra Reich. Sandra is joined by top therapist Georgia Dow in this revolutionary anxiety videos therapy series. Thousands of people have benefited from this scientifically proven treatment approach. Isn't it time you chose yourself? Visit anxiety-videos.com right now. That's anxiety-videos.com. 
and change your life forever. You are listening to Straight Talk with Sandra Reich. To connect with the program today, please call 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email to info at helpforanxietydepression.com. Now, back to Straight Talk. Here's Sandra Reich. We're back with Straight Talk with Sandra Reich, and I have to say it's almost hard for me to focus on when to take the commercial breaks because I'm listening to the brilliance uh, and life-changing Dr. Sue Johnson. She's had that impact on my life. Personally, I've heard her speak. I couldn't stop. Uh, like My eyes were like huge listening to her. She's a great speaker. If you ever get a chance to hear her speak, her books are unbelievable. Hold me tight and love sense. Don't miss them. And we're just talking about this strange situation experiment um, and how finding these three attachment styles in particular then play out in love relationships. And that's where we left off. Can you take us back there, Dr. Johnson? Yes. Um, so basically this basic bonding on um, child and parent research and how this drama of needs and connection and disconnection played out um, really has already revolutionized parenting in our society. We already see children differently than we did um, in the 1960s and 70s. We wouldn't dream of just taking our child to the hospital and leaving the child there for five days by themselves, which is what we used to do at that time. Amazing. We've it's changed how we see children, it's changed how we respond to children. And really now, since about the nineteen nineties, um, we've started to study adult bonding. And what people like me are trying to do is create a similar revolution in understanding adult relationships where we understand that romantic love is an attachment bond. It's got the same patterns it's got the same um, needs and responses, uh, the same emotions um, as you see between a mother and child. Of course, it's different in that an adult relationship is reciprocal. Um, both people depend on each other. It's different in that adults don't need their loved one beside them every minute. They carry them in their mind. You know, they have imaginary conversations with them. They comfort themselves by just thinking about their partner or what their partner might say. Little child can't do that. And also, romantic love, in romantic love, you have a sexual element, um, you know, and that, in a way, has confused everything because um, in romantic love, we've kind of focused on sexual desire and, you know, we haven't really understood we focus on it without sort of always understanding the emotions behind it. Um, what attachment, adult attachment science says is that adult sexuality, passion, for example, in a good um, love relationship with a secure bond is really this longing for connection and attachment um, that's twinned up with the ability to attune to each other help each other stay balanced emotionally, and then play, go into erotic play. And this passion, we can renew it again and again and again through the lifetime of a relationship as we go through moments of disconnection and then learn how to reach for each other and connect again. I mean, it's, this new science is really telling us that this dream that almost every civilization has had of um, a lasting, loving, um, deeply satisfying relationship that would go through adulthood um, is possible and we can learn to do it and we can learn what goes wrong. That's pretty revolutionary because yeah. love, romantic love, has always been seen as kind of a mysterious force that comes and hits you in the head. You, know, you fall in, right. you fall out, and there's nothing you can do. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so many of my couples feel that way and they feel that they it's unfixable. So based on what you're telling me about secure attachment, I'm imagining if two securely attached people fall in love and they're facing a difficult time in their relationship, they might have a little bit more to draw upon because they'd be able to reach in and self-soothe during a difficult moment. Is that right? Yes. They've got more... They've learned how to self-soothe. They learned it in their loving relationships as they grew up. Um, and they've learned to trust other people, so they're, they're often less um, vulnerable and threatened to begin with. So, you know, it's kind of like they've been given resources. But, you know, relationships can be very difficult, and most of us don't start out with a map and we still hurt each other and miss each other's cues and end up in terrible patterns that we know um, really create distress in relationships. The most popular one in North America is um, one person doesn't feel connected and starts demanding and getting critical and pushing for closeness, and the other person feels attacked and moves away, shuts down, shuts them out. And the more the first person feels shut out, the more they push and um, sort of raise their voice to get attention. And you get a horrible demand withdrawal pattern that leaves both people feeling deserted and rejected and um, distressed and alone. And that is really predicts divorce. And people get caught up in that. You know, they, they don't know... Even they can lose sight, even if they had a secure relationship with their parents in childhood, they can lose sight of um, what's going on in their relationship and they can just get caught in this pattern and decide that their partner is the enemy. And so, um, you know, even secure folks who kind of know more about bonding and have more emotional balance to begin with can end up getting in very distressed dances with their partner where they're shutting down or attacking all the time and losing their faith in that partner and losing their their belief that you can really create this connection. So what we do in Emotionally Focused Couples Therapy and what I talk about in my book, Hold Me Tight, is we help them understand this negative pattern that they're caught in and learn how to turn and um, make sense of their emotions and their needs and learn how to reach for each other again in a, and reach in a way that pulls the other person close. Um, and that's pretty amazing stuff. You know, it it's is. Like, uh, it's it, it's uh, for some people who've never really understood how to do that, it is quite... Um, it's like Star Wars or uh, you know, it's like magic when they learn yeah. how to do this. So the example you gave where somebody is sort of criticizing and pursuing and someone sort of wants to get away is like most likely an an anxious attachment style with an avoidant attachment style. Is that right? Yes. It's like okay. one person's pushing saying, are you there for me? Are you there for me? Do I matter to you? And they're saying it so loudly <laughs> that they scare the other person, and the other person says, no, I'm going to shut down. Yeah. I'm going to protect myself and turn away, and the more they turn away, the more the other person pushes. And, you know, it's so easy to get caught in this. It's, it's so easy. Um, we, we, the drama is so powerful. The emotions are so high. We don't understand what's happening to us. We, we lose our balance. And and then we lose the ability to reach for each other. And this is the drama that every single romantic novel and every single Hollywood movie has portrayed since the beginning of time. And it resonates with all of us because we can all get stuck in it. The, the difference really with more secure couples and couples at the end of emotionally focused couples therapy is not that they never get stuck in these patterns, but that they um, are much more likely to be able to turn back towards each other and reach and find their way back to connection again, to take the risks, um, to talk about their needs, to recognize their needs. It's pretty hard to ask for what you need in a relationship when 
you don't even know how to put that into words. That's really hard. Or when you're even ashamed of your needs. So we've, we've kind of taught people that adults aren't supposed to need other people, which in the light of this new science is, is really, really poisonous yes. misinformation. You know, we, we all need um, people that will respond to us. That's our basic safety mechanism, you know, for being in the world. Yeah, you describe when you can't um, feel that person or you feel abandoned, that it's equivalent to physical pain. Yes. You know, yeah. um, uh, there are some theorists who actually talk about, there's um, a man called Yak Pangsep who studies um, brains over the last few years and emotions. And he talks about the fact that in human beings, um, that not being able to stay connected with your main attachment figure, the person that you're bonded to, um, losing that connection is a, is a special neural pathway in your brain. And people go into what he calls primal panic. It's really, what this always boils down to is, that in the end, the most terrifying thing for mankind is not the big scary monster in the closet, um, you know, that we dream of when we're young. It's um, isolation. It's finding yourself alone. Uh, you know, we are not built for that. Uh, I mean, we don't, you know, when we're going to have a war, two soldiers don't go off by themselves and fight. Um, we fight in groups. We face the world in groups where, you know, that's just who we are. I mean, we know that we're vulnerable on, on a very basic level. So that's the way we deal with our vulnerability. Fascinating. Um, so, you know, going back to the example, just so people understand, so we've got somebody pursuing and they're getting very anxious and we've got someone avoiding because they're getting very anxious. It really doesn't mean that they don't care about each other. They're just totally in their anxiety response. So how, yes. do, how do they do that? First of all, they have to understand where they're caught and they have to be able to look at their dance and yeah. understand that the dance is the problem that the other person isn't trying to do them in, the other person isn't the enemy. So we give them that perspective and we help them understand that everyone gets caught in this dance at some point, that it doesn't mean anything about them. They're not bad or wrong or, you know, unloving people. And then we help them um, talk about the emotions that are really going on, that, you know, they're not just irritated or numbed out that they're, um, they're feeling afraid of being rejected or they're longing to be close and feeling abandoned. And when they start to be able to acknowledge these softer parts of themselves and that what they're really looking for is a way to reconnect and feel important to the other person, the music in the relationship starts to change, the emotional music, and then they start to be able to help e help each other step out of this negative pattern and slowly, slowly learn when they feel disconnected to turn towards each other and risk talking about their needs, talking about their softer emotions uh, in a way that helps the other person respond to them. So, you know, people at the end of our therapy, uh, we've shown again and again that the conversations that change a relationship, you know, they're, they're the same. The conversations are always about um, risking the other person, letting them in, asking them for what you need, and being able, and when your partner does this for you, to you, for you to be able to listen and respond. It's emotional responsiveness that in the yeah. end defines the quality of a love relationship. That's what... That is the essence of what defines love, emotional responsiveness. And that's a skill that can be really learned. And for couples listening that are in the struggle right now, they, by understanding how to, you know, talk to your partner in a way, in a soft way, vulnerable way, as you discussed, that they will be heard because usually there's a connection over the same feelings that the avoidant and the anxiously attached are feeling. They're both wondering, are you there for me? Can I count on you to quote your words, Dr. Johnson? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, it's... Um, that's the other thing about it, you know, um, 
what we know is that empathy is wired in. Um, you don't really have to learn empathy. What you have to do is get the blocks to empathy out of the way. You know, it's pretty difficult for me to really tune into you when I'm dealing with, you know, a huge amount of fear. I'm just, all I'm listening to is my own fears. But if I can sort of understand those fears and, and not be so overwhelmed by them and kind of look at them from a distance um, and understand there's nothing wrong with them, they're just part of being human, and then you can start to talk to me in a different way, I can learn to turn and tune into you. you know, that's a natural skill that most people have, and I can learn to tune into you. And when I tune into you, for most people, there's a natural responsiveness there. We want to, uh, we feel the hurts of the people we love. You know, it, we feel them too. We don't want them to hurt. Um, we want to be there for the people we love. We want them to need us. It's just that so much of the time our confusion, our sense of being overwhelmed and hopeless just gets in the way. You know, we need, we need a map. We need a map to love and loving, and then we can do it properly. And your gift to the world is you have given us that map. We're going to take a short break, and we're going to come back and talk about how this secure relationship actually affects your sex life. We'll be right back with Straight Talk with Sandra Reich. Change your life forever with the latest cutting-edge products for home study treatment for anxiety featuring the clinical director of the Montreal Center for Anxiety and Depression and host of Straight Talk, Sandra Reich. Sandra is joined by top therapist Georgia Dow in this revolutionary anxiety videos therapy series. Thousands of people have benefited from this scientifically proven treatment approach. Isn't it time you chose yourself? Visit anxiety-videos.com right now. That's anxiety-videos.com and change your life forever. Join the therapist who is affectionately known as the couple whisperer, Sandra Reich, on her famous couple retreats and change your life forever. Sandra offers couple retreats in beautiful locations several times a year that can radically change your love life. Couples describe her retreats as life-changing. Regain that loving feeling. Bring your intimacy to a new level and rediscover excitement and joy. Find out more at helpforanxietydepression.com or call 514-796-4357. We all want love and safety. Now you can have it. Call 514-796-4357 or helpforanxietydepression.com. Spa Munari is a full-service wellness day spa located at the heart of West Island, Quebec. Submerge yourself in beauty with one of our many treatments, specially catered to your needs. We offer facials, manicures, pedicures, hair removal, massages, body treatments, and so much more. Enjoy our ultimate relaxation experience with our spa packages. We offer a men's menu as well. Call us today to book your next appointment at 514-695-5040 or visit us on the web at spamunari.com. That's 514-695-5040 or spamunari.com. You are listening to Straight Talk with Sandra Reich. To connect with the program today, please call 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email to info at helpforanxietydepression.com. Now, back to Straight Talk. Here's Sandra Reich. 
We're back with Straight Talk with Sandra Reich. On the break, I was begging Dr. Johnson to come back because there is so much to talk about. And I think her work is so uh, full of ways for people to change their race relationships in ways that they could not have ever imagined. I'm telling you, run to the bookstore, get Love Sense. If you don't have Hold Me Tight and want to learn about what a Hold Me Tight conversation is, these are books that are just life-changing. And so much of what you're struggling with will make sense to you. Now, I left you with a bit of a cliffhanger about sex. So in, in Love Sense, Dr. Johnson, you say that it's, it's not good sex that leads to satisfying secure relationships. It's secure loves that leads to great, actual, the best sex. Well, that was very <laughs> interesting to read. I was like, oh, okay, talk to me. Well, they, you know, of course they influence each other. The point is that the more open, it's all about being accessible and open and responsive and engaged. You know, the big question in love is, are you there for me? A-R-E. Are you accessible? Can I reach you? Will you respond to me if I call? Are you engaged with me? Will you come close? And that is kind of what defines love relationships. And it also defines our sexuality. If you think about it, um, good sex is an enormously elaborate uh, dance. It's, it requires a lot of attunement and coordination. It yeah. requires sort of moving together. You know, if you watch birds in bonding dances, in, in mating dances, you see them imitate each other, tune into each other, respond to each other, and that's what good sex is about. And it requires that people know how to coordinate responses and tune in, respond to each other. So the ARE operates in the bedroom as well. And more, if you're emotionally open and responsive, your emotions start in the body, you're much more likely to be physically open and responsive and engaged. And indeed, the research says that securely attached folks um, enjoy sex more, they have sex more often, um, you know, they're better at dealing with sexual problems because you know, if you're going to have sex over a long period of time, you're going to have problems. You're going to have, you know, one person's desire sort of wanes, another person's desire goes up. There's sexual problems as you get older. Um, there's all kinds of issues. And what we know is that securely attached folks can deal with those issues together. They, um, you know, they say they're more sexually satisfied. Um, they feel better about themselves sexually. They have better um, self-image. They can deal with, um, you know, differences in desire, for example. You know, um, at the end of therapy, when a couple know how to reach for each other in our sessions, um, if one person wants to make love on the Friday night and the other person doesn't, it's just a little bit upsetting because they can still comfort each other and hold each other and, you know, the emotional consequences aren't huge. Whereas for other couples who don't have that secure bond, if one person wants to make love on Friday night and the other person doesn't, it's a complete catastrophe. It right. creates an enormous fight or it ends up with one person going off in a half and not speaking for a week. So, you know, it's, it's kind of um, the emotion, the way you deal with your emotions um, impacts everything in bed and out of bed. How you engage emotionally is how you engage physically is how you make love. So we're at the point where all this new research on love and bonding and attachment is, is being applied to sexuality. And it's helping us understand that, you know, what I talk about in Hold Me Tight is that you can really say that there's three different kind of ways of, of making love. Securely attached folks are much more likely to have what I call synchrony sex, where they can share needs and they, they have sex for lots of different reasons, to be close, to give each other pleasure, to have an orgasm, to explore, just to explore the relationship, you know, and... Um, they're much more likely to tune into the other person, to communicate more about sexuality, to feel relaxed 
and we call this synchrony sex. And it goes against the old idea that um, a secure, loving relationship results in vanilla sex. That's not true. It's disconnection that creates um, disconnected sex. It's emotional disconnection that creates physical disconnection. Securely attached folks have great sex, right? They report much more satisfaction. Whereas anxiously attached folks have what we call, are much more likely to have what we call solace sex, where um, if you talk to men and women who don't really believe their partner loves them, who are always on the lookout for being rejected or deserted, um, these people uh, say things like, well, of course, orgasm is important, but, you know, what's important is that when we make love, I know that he really loves me. That's mm. what I like. And, and then I know that she desires me, and then I feel like a man. You know, and they focus on the sort of comfort involved in sex, the reassurance. Um, and then they don't very often go into erotic play. Mm. And then you get the avoidant folks who are really uncomfortable with closeness and what they focus on is performance sexual performance and sensation so they they are the folks men and women who say um well you know i want a certain kind of orgasm and i want it within so many minutes and you know i want you to do this and this so that i have the orgasm i don't want to cuddle afterwards i just want to go to sleep mm. i'm just fine i don't need to talk or spend a lot of time in foreplay, you know, they have what we call sealed off sex. Mm. And the trouble with that one is that even though they might be good at sexual technique, um, the partner usually feels isolated. Sure. It's like you're doing something very intimate on one level, except the other person isn't really there. In fact, um, avoidant sex is what I call, you know, there's, there's that old phrase, having a lovely time, wish I was here. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Wow. They're not, so, they're not really engaged. Okay, and so, so after a while, the partner starts to just move away because um, we don't just want um, orgasms in sex. Well, you know, um, our sexuality is regulated a lot by a bonding hormone called oxytocin. Yeah. And, you know, oxytocin is, it, it, it sort of gets you ready, not just to have an orgasm, but to bond. And so um, for most people, it becomes punishing, even if the sexual technique is good, it becomes somehow punishing and painful to make love, so-called, have sex with somebody who's emotionally absent. There's a kind of flatness there. You know, mm. it's like, um, and if you listen to avoidant, more avoidant folks, um, you know, talk about sex, they, they talk about it in terms of performance and sensation. What is interesting is that when you work with folks who are, um, more, have learned to be more avoidant, usually because of their childhood in therapy, it's almost like they kind of fall out they start to listen to their own emotions and needs. They start to take risks with their partner. And, of course, they'll be different, they'll be different um, out of bed and in bed then. They start to be able to have a different kind of sexuality. Um, our research says that in EFT, which is what we call emotionally focused couple therapy, in EFT, um, the, la the last research study we did, that people not only felt more secure, had more trust, uh, felt more satisfied, were more securely attached even, um, but their sex lives also improved. They felt much better about making love with their partner. That's pretty pretty impressive. So to it's recap... It's fascinating, to, isn't it? 
It's, 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 you know, that's why it, there's so much to talk about it. It's so wild. I want to ask you about two things is that one, so to recap something you said, if someone does not feel safe, does not feel their partner is there for them, you can't count on them. You definitely are saying that the sex life is going to definitely pay the price because if, if I yeah. reach for you, I can't count for you. I'm, I'm not having sex with you. Yeah. Well, also if I do have sex, I have it in a protected kind of way. You know, I'm not fully engaged. You know, I right. can't really be, you know, secure attachment results in sort of relaxed, playful, open sexuality. You know, it's, it's, um, it allows you to be erotically involved, right? You don't play when you're being careful or when you're about to be abandoned or about to be rejected. Um, you know, it's like, um, you can't do those two things at the same time. So, so yeah, that's right. And the second question I have is we, you know, just so everyone understands. So we talk about our childhood and uh, some people were lucky enough to grow up in a securely attached environment. Um, and, but then there's the people who could be classified as avoidance or insecurely attached. Now you're talking about the fact that a secure attachment will allow for great sex and monogamy and like, it's all fabulous. So can, in, just so we're clear, I know the answer, but I want to make sure everyone understands. Can an insecurely attached or an avoidantly attached person become securely attached. Yes. And that's what's wonderful. When we understand what's going on, we can shape it. So in our last study, which um, is just coming out in the Journal of Marriage and Family Therapy, uh, and this is a real first in research, um, what we found was we that by helping people have these bonding conversations and doing emotionally focused couples therapy, we not only made them happier in their relationship, um, a little closer, et cetera, et cetera, we took them through bonding conversations to the point where they told us they were more securely attached. And that included anxiously attached folks and it also who, all, who you know, came in needing all kinds of reassurance. And it also included avoidantly attached folks who came in saying, well, I just want the fights to stop, but I don't really know about being close, and I don't really want these emotional conversations. I just want this person off my back. Those folks changed too. You know, they started to really explore their needs and to admit that, you know, they did have these softer feelings and they do need support and comfort because that's just who we are as human beings. And they started to understand that there are ways to ask for those needs to be met that pulls your partner towards you. And so we can learn. The wonderful thing about this is once we understand love, this whole world opens up. We can learn how to shape it and create it, how to repair it. And that, um, you know, some people don't like that idea because they want to hold on to the idea of love as a, as a mystery that, you know, sort of just comes and hits you in the head. <laughs> yeah. um, but personally, I think that's disastrous. Um, you know, most of us want to create long-term relationships and um, have a partner standing beside us for most of our life. And so to leave love as a fairy tale, to leave love as a mystery that you don't have any control over, it might be pretty exciting for about six months when you're 21. <laughs> but after that, it's a tragedy. You know, we, yeah. And we're learning that, yes, you can start off life with a you know, very neglectful parenting, feeling very alone, and the only way you can survive is to shut down your emotions and try not to need people. And you can indeed, if we understand love, you can learn about your patterns. You can learn that there were very good reasons for them. You can start to change them, learn how to take risks with other people, and you can move into out of that sort of shutdown place um, into more secure connection. And, of course, you can learn to deal with your anxiety, in, you know, in a relationship and learn how to... Um, change the way you talk about that anxiety, for example, so that you can start to feel closer and more trusting with 
for people. This is more than having a good love relationship. I mean, love grows people. And, you know, what we see in our couples is people don't just have better relationships. They feel better about themselves as human beings. They're more resilient. They're more able to deal with stress. So, um, you know, it's, it's quite amazing what we've learned by sort of attending to this basic emotional drama, you know, what happens between lovers at moments of connection and disconnection. It's amazing how much we've learned in the last 20 years from looking at this. Uh, thanks uh, in, very much in part to your work, I should say. Um, I mean, what you've just said right now, I have two quick things I want to get out there before we run out of time so sadly, is that, you know, what you're saying, if I understand you right, is that um, not only can we take our difficult childhoods and in a relationship heal them, but yes. therefore, it, I mean, that's like, that's beyond because everybody wants a secure attachment, but we didn't all get it. But you're saying that when right. couple, couples learn to attune to each other and learn the skills, they can get the secure attachment they've ever, always dreamt of. And where it's relevant to a lot of the people who are listening to the show is I run an anxiety and depression clinic here in Montreal. And what you're saying is when we don't honor or nurture our emotional connections, the price we pay is depression and anxiety. That's right. That's exactly right. Wow. That's right. Yeah, that's that's that's, right. that's huge. Um, I, you know, it's I knew this was going to happen. That it was the time was going to go so fast. And I know you are an extremely busy, lady. I'm going to try to get you back on. I want to talk, and maybe we can give a little flirtation on that on mirror neurons. And this is such a fascinating part of psychology about the ability. Well, well why don't you tell us a little bit what mirror neurons on, and then we'll we'll have to say a quick goodbye. We've got about a minute left. Um, well, basically. Um, mirror neurons were discovered by a group of Italian scientists not that long ago when, um, you know, they started to understand that um, if you looked at monkeys, the way monkeys responded to people, you know, you started to um, get that the monkey was mirroring you and was um, sort of picking up on your emotional cues you know, it's like the monkey watches you eat the banana. His emotional expressions look like he's enjoying the banana too. He's tuning into you eating the banana. He's feeling your pleasure. And so they started really, because with monkeys, you know, you can actually go look in their brains. We're not allowed to do that with human beings unless we use a brain scan. So um, really this whole science has, has um, been created around the fact that we have these mirror neurons, the function of which is to tune us in to the signals coming from somebody else. So when you look at somebody's face, for example, your facial muscles start to imitate the emotional expression you see on the other person's face. Your mirror neurons are turned on. You start to imitate what you see on the other person's face and then you, you actually get the feeling in your body of what you see happening to the other person. And this is basically considered to be the basis of empathy, the basis of altruism, the basis of caring for other people. We feel for other people. And mirror neurons are um, our scientific way of describing exactly how that happens. And it's amazing when you think about it. It's... Um, I mean, it speaks to the fact that we understand more and more that we're bonding animals, we're social animals, we're animals that are designed for connection. That's what we are. You are a gift to the world, Dr. Johnson. I cannot thank you enough for taking time. You are. You you really are. And you need to take that in because you've helped so many people, uh, myself and so many couples who have walked through the practice by understanding this stuff. Um, emotional focus therapy, an unbelievable Sue, Dr. Sue Johnson. Her books are Hold Me Tight and Love Sense life-changing. I cannot recommend them enough. Um, I'm, again, going to try very hard to get you back on so we can talk a little bit more about oxytocin, mirror neurons, and lots of other exciting stuff. Um, but okay. I, want, I want to thank you so much. You've been a mentor to me, and this has been a tremendous honor for me. So thank you so much. I'm sure everyone... You are most has... welcome. It was incredible fun. Take care now. Okay. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is Straight Talk. We'll see you next week. Keep your eyes on the stars.
thank you for listening to Straight Talk with Sandra Reich. We hope you've enjoyed today's show and we'll tune in again next Thursday at 3 p.m. Pacific Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Now, go live your best life.